Welcome, welcome everyone to an exciting evening of discussing the GMAT. I hope that's what you're here for. If you're not, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> um, as everyone joins, please let me know, where are you joining from? This is one of my favorite parts of teaching these sessions. I get to see and hear from people who are really all over the place. Um, some of you maybe already know that if you've come to some of my other sessions. Brazil, see, this is so much fun. You're leading strong. <laughs> Excellent. I am located in Ann Arbor, Michigan area. Uh, so we just had some recent snowfalls that made me wish I was back in California where I was living for a few years. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful place though, overall. Overall, very nice. Um, excellent. If you would also like to, as you join, please let me know where you are in your studying. I get a variety of different folks who are maybe just starting their study journey, uh, some people who have been studying for quite some time and are maybe getting back into it or getting close to their anticipated test date and are looking for some helpful information about how to continue improving. Excellent. Well, we will get started as you continue to enter answers in chat. Today is December for how is it even possible? How are we in December? I don't know. All right, this is one of our free study options, obviously. Uh, you can also try these other free study options. We try to do a, a good job of putting out free resources to help people continue their studies on their own if they choose to do so. Of course, we do have our paid courses as well, but ultimately you could study independently and many of you probably are at this point. Uh, you could try, try a live GMAT class. I have a class session coming up that starts in January. The first session of each class is always free. So the first session of each course. Uh, you can also try out our on-demand course for free. And then we have a Foundations of Math that used to be a paid part of our full course, but we've opened this up as a free option as well to help more individuals study. Awesome, we've got some, someone joining from Toronto here as well, nice. Okay, hi. hi, joining from Beijing, that's awesome too. Excellent. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about a topic that I have been thinking about for quite some time. This is something that I've been thinking about as I teach my courses, thinking about as I'm tutoring students, and I really boiled some things down into these top five challenges that students face essentially. Um, I see these repeated over and over and over again. So I will be sending this video to some of my course students as well to make sure that they hear some of these messages. <laughs> Ultimately, there are other sections too, right? There are gonna be other things beyond these five that you could know, but these are the things that I see repeating over and over and over again in terms of barriers for students reaching their goal score. The first thing that I notice is managing section timing. So when I say section timing, I mean timing within the quant section, timing within the verbal section. Uh, that could relate to individual problems, it could relate to the section as a whole, but overall timing is just a serious concern. I see this holding a lot of people back. Whew, the second one. I put a second on the list, but I thought about putting it first. Maintaining mental and emotional energy. I don't know any of you who feel super jazzed <laughs> about heading into the GMAT, right? Maybe the first question, but by question 30 on each section, you're probably feeling a little bit drained. You have to focus and work on building the ability to maintain your mental and emotional energy. We're gonna talk about some ways to do that. So I'm talking about these five challenges this evening, but I'm also talking about some exercises that I have found to be helpful. These are things I've discussed with my course students, things I've discussed with tutoring students, and things that I've seen to work for them. Number three, following a clear process for each question type. This is a good one too. Um, we're gonna talk about how you know whether this is an issue for you, right? So for each of these items that I'm bringing up, we'll not only talk about ways to address it, but we'll talk about how do you know if this is something that you struggle with? Using question and section strategies is number four. So beyond just having a good process and approaching each question and each section appropriately, 
there are some strategies you can use that are very helpful to get through them. And then number five, treating the GMAT like the unique little gem that it is. <laughs> uh, truly is a very unique exam, unlike many other standardized tests, but students tend to think of it as similar to other exams, and sometimes that is to their detriment. As we go along here, please let me know in chat if you have any questions. I do have it open, so I'll be watching for those. All right, what am I gonna show you tonight? First, I'm gonna show you potential indicators, how you can identify whether each of these things is an issue that you particularly face. And then we're also gonna talk about exercises so that you can develop new skills and habits and to continue improving. Again, I've chosen each, chosen each of these things particularly because I've seen this occur so many times for so many students. So this first one, not managing section timing, what are the potential indicators? How do you know if this is you? Well, the, the key indicator is if you run out of time or equally adversely, if you have extra time left, this can be on time sets that you're attempting, it can be on cat sections, but if you're noticing that at the end you can't get through the last few problems or you end a section and have five or six or 10 or 20 minutes left, that's a pretty big issue, right? You wanna make sure that you are managing that more closely. And the 20 minutes is true, I've seen this happen where students had 20 minutes left in a section. Now, timing is important because you don't have a lot of it, right? So ultimately, when you're managing your timing effectively, it means that you're managing the only resource that you really have, right? If you are going to invest in individual problems, then you have to decide specifically that you're going to attempt that problem. If you're running out of time at the end, it means you're giving away points. If you have extra time left over, it means that you could have gotten extra points by investing that time more wisely. You can see that on the section level in these first two bullets, but in this third bullet, you can see it on an individual question level, right? If you see yourself regularly spending more than three minutes on individual problems, that shows you that you have a problem with timing as well. You also may see that you spend less than a minute on easy or moderate difficulty problems and that you're getting them incorrect. I have, I've seen this happen to students and they come to me and say, yeah, but you don't need to worry about it. We don't, we don't have to worry because I know what I did wrong and I know how to fix it. But if you're doing this on CAT exams, the problem is that you're practicing the way that you're gonna perform later, right? So it's a bigger issue than just, I know what I did wrong. It's, you have to be training yourself to approach the exam in the correct way. Excellent. So what do you do about it? There are so many different things that you can do, so many exercises that you can perform. I have pulled some of my favorites, some of my most creative and interesting ones. All right. The first one is creating and practicing your time tracking plan. And you should really do this for every single cat. For Manhattan Prep, we use something called the yellow pad or the whiteboard method, which is something that absolutely is valuable. Uh, there are blog posts that we have about this and how to do it. You can also create your own tracking system. Ultimately, what this is about, though, is making sure that you're paying attention to your timing throughout a section and that you know where you should be. Where, you, where are you and where is ideal? Those are a couple of things that you should be monitoring regularly. The next one here is a notice your timing time set. So it's just, you complete a typical time set, but after every single problem, you check to see how much time you have left for that set. Why after every problem? Well, this is not a good behavior for cats, <laughs> but sometimes you need to swing the pendulum a little bit too far in the opposite direction, right? If you were struggling to check your timing at all throughout a section, complete these time sets, force yourself to look at your timing after every single problem. And then on your cats, hopefully you'll kind of swing back to equilibrium and find that good balance. These last two are my favorites for this, for timing. So the rushed time set is something that I have many, many students, especially tutoring students do. And this is particularly helpful for those of you who are consistently running out of time. 
One reason that you're probably running out of time is that you're over investing in some problems and then not bailing to make up for that. So this rush time set is really teaching you how do you get back on track when you have fallen behind. What you're gonna do for this is to complete a time set, but give yourself less time than you normally would. So as an example, you would complete four questions in six minutes, whereas you would typically give yourself eight. The slow time set is the opposite. So instead of giving yourself eight minutes for four questions, for example, you might give yourself nine minutes. It's not gonna be a lot more, but your goal is to use that entire time. This is for people who have a lot of time left over in each section, typically. You're forcing yourself intentionally to slow down. Now in chat, do any of you struggle with timing at all? I would guess that at least some of you do. That would be my guess. Let's see if I'm correct. Especially word problems. Yeah, and DS. Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of people tend to struggle with the problems that, that are very wordy, right? So word problems in the quant section, um, reading comprehension problems, critical reasoning problems. Um, the other thing that you can get really good at if you're moving more slowly on those and struggling with timing is to practice how you're reading. There is a YouTube video that I created not, not too long ago, and it's all about how do you approach reading comprehension problems? How do you read effectively on the GMAT? So that's another good video to check out. Yeah, struggle with over-investing on some problems and then not bailing on others to make up for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, this rush time set, very helpful for overcoming that. You have to practice that good behavior when you're thinking of bailing, right? It's not something that just comes naturally. In fact, it, it's very unnatural to a lot of people. <laughs> you come in and you've been taught to do things one way all of your life. You attempt every problem, you get all the problems right, you do your best. And on the GMAT, that's not quite the strategy that you're looking to use. On the GMAT, you're looking to use your time wisely. And sometimes that means letting go of some problems. Yeah, this, this last comment here is uh, overall good cat completion timing, but specific questions can go over on them. Yeah, and that's a good one. If you're struggling with that, it's good to do the notice your timing time set. You really want to make sure that you're aware of how much time you're spending, right? You need to know what three minutes feels like because you should never be spending more than three minutes on any problem. On quant problems, on verbal problems, really it should be more like two and a half minutes is your cutoff. But how do you get good at that? Well, you get good at it by knowing what that feels like. What does three minutes feel like? What do, what do two minutes feel like? Once you get used to that feeling, then you can manage your time more effectively. All right. So that is managing section timing. Uh, there's also some question timing stuff in here, obviously, as well, because the questions add up to the section. All right, not maintaining energy. We're thinking about mental and emotional energy here. This is something that over the last year or so, especially, I've just become more and more aware of as people are experiencing a lot of burnout in their own lives and then trying to study for the GMAT as well, right? How do you know if you are not maintaining your energy throughout the exam? Well, one key indicator that I see of this is missing multiple questions in a row. Now, when I say this, I'm meaning in a time set, but even more particularly in your CAT exams. So if you were to go and look at one of your previous CATs and see which problems you missed specifically, are there sections where you're missing three or four or five problems in a row? If so, probably what's happening is that you're experiencing some carryover. You're carrying frustration through, your emotional energy is drained, your mental energy is drained. Um, that's a key indicator. Another good indicator that I've seen is when students perform significantly better in the first half of the section than the second half. Um, 
Sometimes I see this happen around one third as well. So thinking of the quant section in particular, it's around question 10 to 15, where things kind of start to go downhill a little bit for people if they get tired. Um, neither half is more important in terms of your overall score, but it is important to keep in mind that spreading out the problems that you miss results in a better score than missing many problems in a row. I'll say that one more time just to make it clear. You don't want to miss a lot of problems in a row necessarily. That will drive your score down. If you're getting a problem right, missing a problem, getting a problem right, missing a problem, that's going to result in likely a better score. If you don't understand why that's the case, we also have some videos on how the GMAT is scored, how the scoring algorithm works. In fact, there was one that came out very recently here, which is a great one to check into. Another way that you might know you're not maintaining your energy is if you get a frustrating question and overinvest in it, then miss several questions following that. So you might be seeing a really difficult question and then you really just invest a lot of time in it. You get really frustrated and then you see this downhill trend. I'm guessing that that's what some of you are, are experiencing when you're talking about some overinvesting. I have a question in chat here about the yellow pad. Are you allowed to write on your yellow pad during your eight minute break? You are not allowed to write on your yellow pad during your eight minute break, no. To the best of my knowledge, at least. Uh, if you do take that eight minute break, then if you have a yellow pad, it means you're in a testing center. So you'll be leaving the testing area and going out into like a break area. Um, you're mentioning timestamps here. For those of you who are following along with this, during the eight minute break, you need to write your timestamps. So this, I'm guessing what you're referring to is how much time you have left. So you're recording that so that you can see where you're at based on what's ideal timing and what, what you're actually looking at in terms of time remaining. If you have those memorized, and if, especially if you use the Manhattan Prep Yellow Pad method, it typically does not take very long to write those. It should take about 30 seconds to at most a minute. It would be nice if you could do it during your break, but it shouldn't be too burdensome. All right, not maintaining energy. One last indicator here is that you make careless mistakes that you can easily recognize later, right? So careless mistakes can be indicators for a lot of different things, but one thing is just feeling fatigued, right? If you're drained mentally, if you're drained emotionally, then you might be missing things that you otherwise would catch. What can you do about it? Yep, that's correct. As soon as your section starts, I would write the timestamps down. And you can get a new yellow pad for each section as well. You can have, so you can have a yellow pad for quant, for example, where you're recording not only your scratch work, but also keeping track of your timing. And then a different yellow pad for the verbal section where, again, you are keeping track of any scratch work and then also tracking your timing. When you're thinking about maintaining your mental and emotional energy, there are several things that you wanna keep in mind. First is that really bailing is gonna be your best friend. One way that you drain your energy or that I have seen students drain their energy more than any other is by attempting all of the difficult problems. If you make it through an entire section and you have chosen to attempt every single problem in that section, then you will definitely be tired at the end. And honestly, you might not get tired at the end. You might get tired in the middle. One great exercise then is an estimating difficulty level drill. So this is if you're struggling to know when you should bail. In a past cat that you've taken, ideally Manhattan Prep, you'll go in and you'll review the problems one by one. For each problem, write down what you think the difficulty level is. Easy, medium, difficult. 
Then when you're done, go back and compare what the actual difficulty level is. Now I say Manhattan Prep just because we very clearly identify the difficulty level on our cats. However, you can use any other practice test as well as long as it identifies difficulty level in each question. You can also do this using the official guide and then ideally like the Manhattan Prep Navigator tool, for example, if you have any of our online resources. The Navigator tool is one that allows you to see explanations that we have written for each official guide question. All right, another great exercise to do if you're struggling to maintain energy is this bailing time set. This is really for those of you who know that you need to bail and say that you're going to bail <laughs> and then simply do not bail when it comes to the actual cat or the actual exam. If that is you, you are in very good company. Do not feel badly. There are so many people that find themselves exactly where, where you are. What you're gonna do in this bailing time set though is essentially bail on 50% of the problems that you see. So you can make this time set anywhere from six problems to about 12 problems. And again, your goal is to solve only 50%. What is that experience like for you? You're gonna reflect on it. You are going to have to choose which problems you bail on. So not every other necessarily, but not all of the problems at the end either. How did you choose? You know, what choices did you make? When you're done with the set, go back and think, would you have made any choices differently? Attempt the problems that you did not solve during the time set, uh, and then really assess, were these actually difficult or could you have done them? What would make you see that in the future? Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a comment in chat here. I struggle to bail, always need another 30 seconds and you'll get it. That's a common mantra, right? It's a common thing that people tell themselves. I just need another 30 seconds, just another 30 seconds. I want you to think about that 30 seconds though as 30 seconds that you're taking from another problem that you can get right. If you're continually investing in one problem, you've reached a two minute mark, you're at two and a half, you're at three. If you're at three minutes, even if you need another 30 seconds, just say goodbye to that problem because it's not your problem, not today. Um, ultimately, because if you're at three minutes for a problem and then you get to three and a half, oof, you've eaten up one and a half minutes for another problem in the quant section, right? So you basically said that you have to bail on something else. Um, it's not always bad to do that. Some problems you do wanna invest in if you know that you can get them right, but usually the reason that you're spending that much time is because it's simply a difficult problem, right? The difficult problems hurt your score less if you miss them than easy problems. If you're missing easy problems, that will hurt your score more. And there's a, a, a good blog article that another Manhattan Prep instructor wrote that I read recently, Reed Arnold wrote it, and he was saying that your goal on the GMAT is not to get problems right. <laughs> Which sounds crazy, right? I mean, your goal is to, it feels like your goal is to go in there and get all these problems correct. That is not your goal. Your goal is to use your time wisely. That is what all of this leads up to, right? It's, you have a very limited amount of time. What do you do with it? That is how you think effectively on the GMAT. All right, another exercise here is the five second pause. These last two are really good if you experience a lot of testing anxiety. This is also good if you notice that you regularly miss several questions in a row. So if you're seeing that trend where it's like, whoa, I missed four questions and then three and then another three, this might be something that you wanna consider. Essentially what you're gonna do is just between each problem, it could be a time set or a cat, you just take a five second pause. Just close your eyes, breathe really deeply and count to five. Sounds really silly, probably feels really silly too. <laughs> uh, but ultimately this is gonna keep you from carrying through a kind of a frantic, anxious energy uh, and help you to just take a moment of pause that will really help your brain significantly. The other way that you could do this is by actually taking a two minute break. Uh, this is something that a lot of students have struggled with. I don't recommend it for everyone, but if you're seeing that your first half is regularly better than your second half in each section, then probably what's happening is that you're just getting very stressed or very tired at some point. 
So what you should do or what you can do about that is pause and take a two minute break. So identify a problem that you're going to bail on anyway, and then literally just sit there for two minutes, clear your mind, take a break, take some deep breaths, Try this on a cat, obviously, before you go in and do it on the official exam. But I want you to see how this impacts your second half. What does it change about your energy as you head into the second half of the section? I have had this be extremely successful, successful for some of my students, um, particularly, again, people who suffered from high testing anxiety. They were not excited about it at first, but what you want to keep in mind is that if you're going into your second half feeling anxious or extremely exhausted, you could end up throwing away many problems, right? You could end up getting a lot of problems incorrect. If you take this two minute break, you'll probably get that one problem incorrect, but you stand a much better chance of getting a lot more of the remainder correct. All right, not using a process to solve questions. Oof, I am all about process. I love process because when you get on the official, when you get to the official exam, what's gonna happen is that everything you thought you knew is probably gonna fly right out of your brain, right? At some point, maybe not the whole time. So if you have been really good at solving questions up to that point, but you have been doing it without really knowing how you're doing it, then you might fall back on some sort of bad habits. Whereas if you have a good process and you know what to do every time a question comes on the screen, then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna fall back on that process that you've learned, which is really positive. If you don't know what I mean by process, basically there are steps that you can take to solve each different question type. Um, so for data sufficiency and problem solving, for example, we call it understand, plan, solve. So it's what you would do when you see any kind of a quant problem appear on the screen. Yeah, I just saw somebody raise their hand. If you would like to ask a question in chat, you can do that and I will get to it here. Um, for verbal, there are other processes, right? Sentence correction, part of the process is taking a first glance, for example, noticing the differences in the answer choices, thinking about what that means in terms of what's being tested. Then after taking that first glance, you read the full sentence for meaning specifically. Third step is that you find a starting point in the sentence, figure out a, an issue that you wanna tackle first. So a split, a variation in the answer choices. And then fourth step is you start to eliminate. Eliminate answer choices that are incorrect from that split that you identified. Every question type has its own process. Um, and if you get good at this and really internalize it, then you won't need to think about what the process is. You'll just naturally do it. If you're not using any kind of a process, though, there are some, there are some potential indicators for that. First is that you make it through problems with no clear direction. You feel like you're just wandering. I hear this from a lot of my students, like, I don't know, I get through it. I'm not really sure what, what I did or how I solved it. But if you're feeling that way a lot of the time, it probably means that you don't have a good thought process for yourself that you're following. Another sign is that you jump into solving right away and miss signs that point toward a logical plan. Uh, this can be for quant and verbal, but it's a little bit more pointed toward quant. So you jump into solving a problem and there was a much better plan if you had just paused to notice what that plan was. This is another area where you might see yourself missing easy to moderate problems because you didn't notice some pattern, you misread information, or you made some careless mistake. Having a, a plan, a process in mind can really help with some of these because ultimately, you're building into your process to notice all of these different things, to read slowly and carefully, to notice patterns that exist, and then to solve really carefully. And then the last one here is to fail to interpret information or understand what it adds to the problem. This sometimes happens related to process because 
if you get used to just reading straight through and then jumping into solving, you may not be actually pausing to understand what you're seeing, right? You might just be, okay, well, this is what I'm seeing. Great, now let's jump. Okay, what's a, what's a good way to start? Um, part of your process should always be understanding the information that you're given and then thinking about how best to proceed. How do you fix it? Well, you gotta give yourself some process. You gotta get some process in your life. <laughs> the first thing you can do is uh, have a question process mapping, basically. And when you do this, you're gonna write out the full process for each question type. You can find information about processes for questions uh, in our blog. You can find it in other places online. You wanna start with the, the questions that are weakest for you. So if you're struggling with data sufficiency, start by writing how to tackle a data sufficiency problem. It shouldn't be hyper-specific, right? It's not about the details of one particular problem or the information in the problem. It's more about what do you do when you see that come on screen? What's the first thing that you should tackle? Okay, what do you do next? Um, Complete some individual problems untimed and keep that process next to you, like an open note quiz for yourself and see how it works out. Is there anything that's missing? Do you need to alter it, make it more specific for yourself? If you do, then adjust it and then keep practicing it. Another is a minute minute drill. This is particularly for quant. Um, it's when you struggle to make yourself understand and generate a plan before you jump into solving. So if you notice that you're reading information quickly and then just jumping into the first solution method that comes to mind, this is something that you should definitely do. So you're going to grab a timer and then for some individual problems, allow yourself exactly one minute to understand and plan and then exactly one minute to solve, unless you choose to fail, of course. On CATS and on the official exam, you're not necessarily gonna divide your time in problems like this. You may spend more time understanding and planning and less time solving. You may spend less time understanding and planning and more time solving. However, if you had to take a guess, what do you think most people spend more of their time on? Understanding and making a plan or solving? I've got one answer. Somebody is voting for understanding and planning. We've got to vote for solving as well. Yeah, so actually what it is going to be then is solving. Most people are spending more of their time solving. Um, I'm noticing this in students because I'm wrecking, I'm, I'm seeing them not have a good plan moving forward, right? They take a look at the information and read it, but they don't really come up with a specific plan to proceed. Instead, it's just kind of, well, what can I do with this? I guess I'll do that. It's not that this never works and it's not a bad thing. It's just that if you're noticing the information and synthesizing it and understanding it fully, then you can make a really good plan. And that sometimes that really good plan saves you a lot of time in the long run. All right, so that's the minute minute drill. The last one is a process time set. Ooh. The only things that you really have on the exam, I've talked about time, right? Time is a very limited resource. Another thing that you have is your ability to follow a clear process. And Many people spend time worrying while they're taking the exam about how many questions they've gotten right, what their score is going to be, et cetera. During the actual exam, you have absolutely no control over that. You don't know what score you're gonna get. You have no idea how many problems you've gotten correct. You also don't know what difficulty level the problems were. So even if you missed them, maybe they were hard problems and they weren't, won't hurt your score very much. There's very little that you know about your score, practically nothing, and there's nothing about it that you can control, right? The only thing that you can control is, are you following a good repeatable process for every single question? Are you making every question count? Are you bailing on the questions that are, you're never gonna solve? 
This process time set then is one in which I don't want you to worry at all about how many questions you get correct. Instead, I want you to assess how good was my process? Did I solve each problem in the best way possible? Did I read the way I should? Did I come up with a good plan? Did I eliminate answer choices effectively? Really drill down on that. And that should be your measure of success when you look at these process time sets. How effectively did you use good process? Honestly, you can do this as much as you want. Ultimately, getting questions right feels nice, but we learn a lot more from our mistakes. And just because you get a problem right or you get a problem wrong, doesn't mean that you're gonna get a similar problem right or wrong on the official exam, right? So it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Focusing on your process though, does tell you a lot because then you learn what you are specifically doing effectively and what you could change. All right, number four, number four or five, we're moving along here. Uh, not using question and section strategies. So this is a little bit different from process. This is like, how can you approach questions and a section as a whole effectively? If you're not using question and section strategies, you may be struggling on easy and moderate problems. You're seeing this as a common theme, right? If you're struggling on easy and moderate problems, there could be a lot of different things that are happening for you. But there's definitely something happening. So if this is you, then definitely think, which of these, which of these challenges am I having? What opportunity do I have to move past this? A lot of my students come to me and say, no, it's just simple, simple careless mistakes but you can't afford those simple and careless mistakes on the official exam. So you have to find a way to practice to avoid them. You're missing logical inferences or making assumptions. This could be misreading information, for example. And so you end up making an assumption that shouldn't be made on a problem um, or you read information correctly, but you don't, don't take that time to pause and think about what the information actually means. Overinvest in difficult problems and underinvest in easy ones. And then last here is miss many of the questions that you guess on. So even when you're bailing and you simply guess on a question, there's still a chance that you can get that question right. And you should take that chance, right? So. Even when you're bailing, it's not necessarily just pick a letter and move on. Sometimes you can do some strategic guessing to help you get at least closer to the correct answer. What should you do about these question and section strategies? Oh, you'll also probably be struggling with timing. Uh, these strategies tend to be time savers. So if you're struggling with timing, it might be because you're not paying attention to your timing or you don't have a good method to track your timing, but it also might be because your strategies are off. Um, the first one we discussed previously, but it's another good one here, estimating difficulty level drill. So you'll go to a CAT, ideally a Manhattan Prep one again, uh, which you can get a free Manhattan Prep CAT, I believe if you go to our free resources, and then estimate the difficulty level of each problem, write your estimate. The next one here is identify and solve West problems. This is for quant specifically. And West is something that I refer to, or the, uh, an acronym that I use. And it stands for work backwards, estimate smart numbers and test cases, West. Um, these are serious time savers when it comes to quant. Um, and knowing how to do them well is really important, but also recognizing when you can do them is extremely important. So for each West method, for all four of them, you're going to identify three to five problems. You can do this in a practice book that you have. You can do this with the official guidebook. You can do this however you get your practice problems. But find three to five that you can solve using each method. So three to five for working backwards, three to five for estimate, et cetera. Once you identify those problems, then, make sure that you can actually solve it using that method. This can like, open up a whole can of worms sometimes because you find a problem and you think, wow, this is a great one for working backwards. And then you try to actually solve using that method and you realize, oh, 
there's a problem with this. I actually can't use working backwards here. Um, so this is a really, really helpful exercise to go through, especially if you're having a problem in the cross section. Um, bailing on difficult questions, cat. This is really fun. <laughs> Take a cat, basically, and bail on every problem that you perceive to be difficult. Not easy, not moderate, but truly difficult. When you're done, reflect on the experience and see what happened to your score. I bring this up because anecdotally, one of the other Manhattan Prep instructors did this recently. Um, she took a cat. She bailed on every single question that she thought was difficult. I think she did this specifically for the quant section. And she ended up bailing on eight problems um, and got, she said, a 48 in the quant section, which is a great quant score. She then later, not long after that, took another cat and thought, you know what, this time I'm really, I'm really going to try in the quant section. I'm not going to bail on so many problems. I'm going to give it my best effort. She did. And guess what her score was? It was a 48. <laughs> it was the same exact score. Realistically, you don't have to miss, you don't have to get every question right in order to do well in either section. Uh, in fact, in quant particularly, you're gonna miss probably quite a few questions. It's which questions you miss that matter the most. Uh, set a bail goal. So bailing is huge, huge, huge on being successful in the GMAT. Um, a lot of people go in and say, yes, I'm gonna bail. I'm gonna bail on three questions. Um, actually, a lot of times, honestly, they won't set that specific of a goal. They'll say, I'm going to bail. I'm going to make sure I bail on some problems. If you set a really specific number for yourself, that's going to help ensure that you're more successful. I would say that three problems is a very safe number of problems to bail on in both sections. Uh, you may want to go even higher than that to more like five-ish, but ultimately you should try it out and see what you feel works best for you. When you set that bail goal, one other thing that you can do is on your yellow pad or on your whiteboard, you can write down a, the number of Bs that match your goal. So if you set a goal to bail on three problems in the quant section, then write three Bs on your scratch work. And every time you do bail, go back and cross one of those off. That way you're actually making sure that you are following through on that action goal that you set for yourself. This last one is super fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a lot of problems on the GMAT that you can get close to the right answer if you're just good at guessing. Um, I don't say this because you should do it on every problem. You absolutely should not do it all of the time. <laughs> but if you see a problem and you recognize that it's really difficult and you think, wow, I need to just bail on this one. There are still some things that you can do. You can take another 10 or 20 seconds and you can think logically about what patterns you're seeing. And if you do that, then sometimes you can get down to maybe two or three answers rather than all five, right? You can eliminate a couple. Once in a while, you can actually just logically even get down to the actual correct answer just by thinking a little bit strategically about it. The best way to go about this is to choose some problems and without actually solving, so don't fully invest in them, don't do any scratch work if it's quant. Um, without solving, just take a guess. What did you base that guess on? Pay attention to that. How accurate were you? And then truly solve the problem after guessing and think, what else could you pay attention to? What else could you have noticed to get closer to the right answer? There is a, there's no teacher quite like experience, right? So if you go through and you have these experiences and then you spend time reflecting on them, oof, you, can, you can make some serious positive impacts for yourself. All right, I am going to let you guys interact and chat just a little bit with me here. Um, I have a question for you. And that question is, among the exercises that you have seen so far, is there one in particular that has resonated the most with you? I've used all of these across a number of different students, but I'm curious to see if there's a group consensus here tonight as well.
not seeing any answers yet, but I'm thinking that's because all of them are so much fun. <laughs> I hope that's the case. Feels like everyone is applicable. Wow, that's awesome. These really are for most people, to be honest. Like all of us do these things at some point or another. I have caught myself doing many of these things at different points. Yeah, the reports from the cats really help. What does that mean? Can you elaborate on that? Oh, yes, yes. When you take the Manhattan prep exams, you can do some sorting uh, based on a number of different categories. Okay, so when you get the reports from the cats, one category, I guess, that you can sort on or one top, uh, I'm trying to come up with a good word for it. Uh, one area that you can sort on is time that you spent on each problem. So you can sort like least time to most or most to least, et cetera. So you can see in particular, which problems did you take, for example, more than three minutes on? Yeah, critical reasoning and time management is a weakness here. Time management is, and, and that can mean so many different things, right? But it's definitely helpful to do some drills and make sure that you are really thinking critically about where you are investing your time. How are you investing it? Are you really investing it in the problems that you get correct? One common trend that I have seen for students is that they invest more time in the problems that they get incorrect. So if you're able to look at a cat and see which problems you miss and also see which problems you take the most time on, there's probably going to be some significant overlap there, especially for problems on which you spent more than three minutes. I often see this for my students. I'll look at their CAT exams and I'll sort by time. And I'll see that most, if not all of the problems that they spent three minutes or more on, they got incorrect. Um, ultimately, they're probably just very difficult problems for them, right? So it's something that they need to recognize earlier on and try to mitigate rather than continue to invest time. Excellent. All right, we are going to continue moving along here. We've got one more, one more thing to talk about. Um, I hope that this is helpful for all of you. This truly is, this condenses many of the things that I have discussed with students in classes and tutoring. It's really very applicable for most people. All right. I teach the GMAT because I think that it is a beautiful little butterfly of an exam. It's a super special exam. <laughs> um, and honestly, it's just incredibly unique. It is not like any other standardized test out there quite. It's most similar maybe to the LSAT. People could argue that point with me, but that's what I think. But you have to treat it uniquely in order to be successful, truly. If you are not treating the GMAT like the unique exam that it is, then one thing you might find yourself doing is seeking to get all questions correct. You're not going to get every question correct. In quant, you're probably going to miss quite a few, maybe even approximately half of the questions, and you can still get a great score. So it's not a problem, it's just how the exam works. You also probably will find yourself over investing in difficult problems and under investing in easier ones. Your goal is not to get questions right, it is to manage your time wisely. That is how the GMAT works, it is a very unique exam. If you're managing your time and if you are managing your process, things will probably go better for you than if you are trying to get every problem correct. Another thing I see a lot of students do is trying to predict their score while taking the exam, right? So it's not that they're calculating anything, but they're just sitting there on the sidelines like, oh man, okay, well, this was a hard problem, so like, maybe I'm doing well, maybe that means something good, or maybe it was an easy problem and I just didn't know it, and so I'm actually doing really badly. Either way, 
it's not a good game to play with yourself, right? Like it's not helpful, it's not serving you. Um, on some typical exams, you can do this, right? You can be like, oh man, how many of these have I gotten right so far? Well, I felt really confident on this one, really confident on this one. And you can kind of play that game. The GMAT is not like that, right? You're moving on past a question. Once a question is in your past, it is in your past, it's done, goodbye. <laughs> You think to yourself, this feels really difficult, so I must be doing badly. The GMAT is an adaptive exam, which means that the better you do, the harder it feels. <laughs> do you get a question right? You get more difficult questions, which means that it's always going to feel kind of bad, probably. <laughs> um, once you get used to that, though, and you really understand which problems to invest your time in and which problems you should just let go of, then it becomes a lot easier to move forward and to feel successful. Another, another um, indicator of this is looking at your subsection scores. So not your score out of 800, but there's another score that you get for each section individually, right? So it goes up to 51 for each. If you look at those scores and think, oh my gosh, that's so bad, that's terrible, without actually looking at how your score changed throughout the section. Um, if you use a Manhattan prep practice test, again, you can get into a free one, then you can see how your subscore changes throughout the exam. And oftentimes what you'll see is that you do far better again on the first half than the second half. So you might get up to a really high subscore in the first half, by the first half, around half of the section. And then on the second half, you just kind of see it steadily drop, right? So you might end up at, a 30 it, it, for the section, for example, but on question 15, you had a 45. That is a real example. I just saw this happen recently. The student came to me and said, oh my gosh, I'm doing so poorly. I got a 30 in this section. Everything's going really badly. And I said, actually, it's not going badly for you. You reached a 45 on question 15, which means that you know a lot about this test. You know how to be successful and to get a really high subscore. You just don't know how to maintain that yet. Uh, so we talked a lot about managing timing. She ran out of time at the end, uh, as well as managing mental and emotional energy, right? Got very tired in the middle of the section and couldn't proceed. What do you do? How do you treat the GMAT like a unique test? How do you treat it like it should be treated? <laughs> um, first off is write what you know. And honestly, I, none of these have use it when, because really you should all be doing this. Everyone should do these things. <laughs> what to do, write out everything that you know about how the GMAT works, and then also write what that means for yourself, right? Limited time, you have to prioritize problems that you can get right. Those problems, the ones that you, you look at and think, oh, I know that I can do this one. Those are the ones that you should invest more time into. I just saw a note in chat here. I'm taking too much time on high level quant problems. By problem five, I'm already solving 700 level questions. So it's tough to let go. You don't have to get them all right though, right? You have to get the ones right that you know that you can. If you're going to miss 10 to 15 questions in the quant section, and most people are even to get higher than 700 score, you get to choose which problems you miss and you get to choose which problems you get correct, right? If you see a problem come up on the screen and you think, ah, well, what is this? <laughs> That's a great opportunity to bail. You usually have some sort of reaction to it, right? I get this very physical reaction to problems that I don't like. I'm like, oh, <laughs> and then I bail on them. <laughs> if you see a problem though and think, you know what? I this should be something I can, I can do. It's a problem that I know, a problem type that I know well, or a content area that I feel comfortable in. Spend more time to make sure that you get it right. GMAT's also adaptive, right? That means that you have to get the easy and medium problems correct in order to ever even see the difficult ones. Missing harder problems hurts your score less. Don't be super concerned about those. Instead, be really worried if you're missing easy problems or moderate difficulty problems. Those you need to get correct. 
uh, scoring algorithm versus points. It's not really a point system, right? It's not like, oh, you get a problem right on the GMAT and you get five points for it. That does not work like that. <laughs> Again, refer to the scoring YouTube video that was created recently. Um, missing easier problems hurts your score more. How many times have I said that tonight? <laughs> it's true. If you're missing easier problems regularly for especially careless mistakes, then you really wanna think about why and you really wanna tighten that up. Um, Subscore evaluation. This is that activity that I was talking about previously. Go look at a cat, focus on your subscore. How did it change throughout each section? When was it the highest? When was it the lowest? Make sure that you assess that and think about what that means in terms of what you were thinking, what you were feeling, and what you were doing during the section, right? You maybe were thinking about feeling fr about frustration or thinking that you were not doing well. So it led to you getting to a low, for example. When it was at its highest, maybe you were thinking very positively. Um, also what you were doing, maybe at the beginning of a section, you tend to follow a strong process and so you do well. And then toward the end of a section that drops off and you do poorer. Either way, you have to look at these trends and see what that means about what you're doing and what you're thinking and feeling and how you can impact that going forward. The last one here is write a personal GMAT contract. It sounds silly. <laughs> I've actually had students do this before though, especially uh, tutoring students who have struggled with bailing and it tends to be very successful. So you're gonna write up your own little contract. You're gonna include what you're not gonna worry about during the exam. So I vow or I, I proclaim that I will not worry about these things. I will not worry about getting every question correct. I will not worry about predicting my score throughout the section and then include what you are gonna think about. You are going to think about following a good process. You are going to think about bailing on difficult, difficult problems. And then literally print this document and sign it and put it somewhere that you can see it regularly. You have to commit to these specific behaviors if you're going to be successful. A lot of students that I've seen know what they need to do and they are not doing it yet. Notice that I added the yet. They are not doing it yet. You can help yourself to do these things. Ultimately, it's about behaviors, right? You being successful in the GMAT is about you knowing the right behaviors to use, practicing those behaviors, and then using them. All right. I have just one more, one number six. I told you it was going to be five, but I'm sneaking the last one in here. <laughs> uh, challenge number six is approaching the GMAT with dread rather than with curiosity. I see a lot of students who just come to the GMAT and they just absolutely dread it, right? They dislike studying or they avoid it. They, I literally heard students groan during new questions. So they had a question just, oh. <laughs> uh, or alternatively, they may panic a little bit. And then basically what they're doing is trying to just get through the practice problems and the content. I just wanna get through this as fast as I can. I just wanna move on to the next thing. So those are the potential indicators. Ideally, how you would look at the GMAT is as a riddle or a puzzle or a game. Um, that is one reason that I have been very successful in the GMAT because I see it as just something that makes me interested, right? Something that I have to solve, some puzzle that I have to, to, to solve. Um, I also look at each question as an opportunity to learn something. So. I think that some questions can be frustrating and some questions can be difficult, but ultimately on every single question, you're learning something new. Even if you choose to bail on a question, you've learned something new about how you recognize to bail on questions. Um, if you look at new problems in that way, rather than as burdens to yourself, you're gonna be much more successful. Ultimately, you wanna see each one and think, wow, what am I gonna, what am I gonna learn about now? Embrace mistakes as well, they help you learn. Some of my students get frustrated because they miss a lot of problems, especially early on in their studying. If you miss a problem, you're probably gonna learn a lot more from that than getting one right, right? If you get a problem right, you give yourself a pat on the back and you move on to the next one. If you get a problem wrong, you stop and think about why. 
and that is extremely valuable. Make sure that you also speak kindly to yourself. It's easy to get down or it's easy to think that you're not going to make progress, but you absolutely can. I know when I was studying, I ended up achieving a 760 on the exam, but I got stuck for quite a while around a 600. And I thought, wow, am I, am I ever gonna get to the next level? Am I ever gonna improve? And I did, and you can. I've seen many other students get past it. It's difficult, but it's possible. And then remember that this exam doesn't define your worth, right? Ultimately, it's a test at the end of the day. It will help you achieve your goals, but it does not define your specific value. All right, I'm opening it up to questions. So if you have any questions now about what we have discussed or about your prep, then please let me see them. As we do that, I also do have an upcoming course that is starting in January, which I mentioned previously. If you are interested, here is a link so that you can see more about it. Again, you don't have to enroll in a paid course. Um, you certainly can study independently. If you would like to explore this, then you can, but otherwise we have the free resources that I mentioned at the beginning of this session. Tips on moving your score from a 680 to a 720. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that is an interesting place to be because usually what that tells me about a student, I'm just backtracking by the way to the free resources slides so that everyone can see that. Um, usually what I, when I see students struggle, there are several different like drop off points essentially, right? This is not specifically scientific. It has not been tested in research studies, but this is from my experience. Um, if you're scoring under a 600, it's probably related to content, right? You need to work on content. You've got some gaps. If you're scoring from a 600 to like a 650, you're probably struggling a lot more with process. Like you don't really have processes ironed out for your questions. You haven't really learned some of the solution methods that you should. Um, and then 650 and up, especially the 680 to 720, a lot of that tends to be more and more about strategy. Um, so when I say strategy, I mean strategy on the section as a whole. So for example, you might be seeing yourself miss multiple problems in a row. Is that happening for you? Alternatively, you may be over-investing in problems that you get ultimately incorrect um, because there was maybe a simpler method to solve them. This is especially true for quant. Looks like you, your quant score is actually better than your verbal score right now as well. Timing issues, yeah. Yeah, and ultimately that matters a lot, right? So as you're moving from a 680 to a 720, specifically if you're focused on timing issues, one thing that you really wanna do for yourself is make sure that you have enough time left at the end of each section to fully invest in the last five problems. Too much time. Does that mean that you have time left over that you've run out of time? Run out of time, yeah. Um, if you're running out of time, then definitely make sure that you, when you're practicing, taking practice tests, you have a good strategy to manage your timing. So you have to make a plan, right? Like, how are you going to track your time? How are you going to know where you should be at? Um, so you need to be paying attention to how much time you have left periodically and then checking, is that about correct? If you have, if you're two minutes off in either direction, like you're behind two minutes or ahead two minutes from where you should be, you should be correcting that immediately, as fast as possible. And then you need to make sure that at the end of the section, you have enough time to devote to the last five problems. I say five just because in the quant section, um, it's not that those last five problems count for more, but if you see your score go down dramatically at the end of a section, 
then you may maybe would have ended much higher, right? So you could have had a much higher subscore. And then if you run out of time on the last five, for example, then ultimately you could see that score drop quite a bit in that range. And then for reading or for verbal, I say the last five because there could be a reading comprehension passage in there, right? So having enough time for those last five in verbal is very important as well. I would say make sure that you have a good plan. Make sure that you have a plan to check timing on your cats and to track where you should be at. What Manhattan Prep uses is called the yellow pad method and we have information about that online. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I have a comparisons question here. There are templates when comparisons are being used. Sam likes oranges more than apples. Sam likes more oranges more than Alex does. Different subjects are being compared. When thinking about comparisons, it's not that I think about templates, it's that I think about um, parallelism. Comparisons have to be parallel in form. Sam likes oranges, a noun, more than apples, another noun. In the second example you give, Sam likes oranges more than Alex does. So the comparison really is Sam likes, subject verb, more than Alex does, subject verb. You wanna be looking for parallelism more than for templates that you have to remember. Oh, awesome, you're tutoring with Mark Sullivan, that's great. Tell him I say hello. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if there are no more questions, it looks like I don't see any others coming through, then thank you all so much for joining this evening. This has been very fun. Um, and definitely go out there and continue your GMAT prep with a hopefully lighter heart. Yeah, I have one more question here. Yep, absolutely. You are very welcome. Thank you for joining. I love these free sessions. These are some of my favorite things to do. Okay, the sentence here is Laos has a land area comparable to Great Britain. Here you're comparing land area to Great Britain. Uh, you can't compare land area and Great Britain because that's not what we're thinking. That's not what Great Britain is, right? Like if you were to if you were to go to Great Britain and you were to call it a land area, they probably would be like. Is that an insult? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a country basically, right? So Laos, country, Great Britain, country. We're comparing similar things if you were to compare those, but land area and a country, just not comparable on the same level. Does that help? When you look at, when you look at comparisons and particular, you have to have parallel forms, but you have to also be comparing logical things. Even if I'm comparing two nouns, for example, like if I say, I like cats more than pineapples. Well, they're, they're technically both nouns, but the logic is bizarre, right? Like here, you have two nouns, you have a land area and you have Great Britain. You can say, I have a toy as large as my head. You could say a land area as large as Great Britain. That's not the original sentence though. The original sentence is Laos has a land area comparable to Great Britain.
Yeah, I think ultimately here for comparisons, a really good idea is to just go and look at some comparisons questions and see some of the trends that you notice and what they bring up, right? There aren't specific templates. I know that was your first question. What other templates exist for comparisons? It's not that there is a good way to go about looking at templates, but you want to start breaking things down and looking at them in terms of what is being compared. Can you logically compare those things? Typically, they're going to be things that are very logical to compare. Like if you're talking about musicians, then you're going to be comparing them to other musicians, for example. If you're talking about a country, you'll compare it to another country um, or another, like a continent, for example. Like I could say, like, the continent of this is as large as the country of this. Um, but they're going to be things that just make sense in context together. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a tough one to come up with like hard and fast rules for. Okay, I'm thinking I'm struggling to see why when I use as large as the nouns being compared are toy versus head and that's okay. And that's not as strict as the case of comparable to. Comparable to is more vague. Comparable in what way? Right, so you have to be clearer in what you're comparing because otherwise the meaning is unclear. There are two things that you're looking for in sentence correction. So if you're looking at a sentence correction um, problem, you are either gonna have an issue, you're either gonna have issues with grammar or you're gonna have issues with meaning. And sometimes there are crossovers there, right? That, because good grammar contributes to good meaning. Um, in terms of grammatical areas, there are a whole bunch of things that could be tested, right? And in terms of meaning, there could be a lot of different types of things being tested as well. Uh, but for meaning, what you really want to think about is, do I know what they mean by this? Am I positive or do I have to make assumptions? Laos has a land area comparable to Great Britain uh, in terms of size, in terms of how much it rains, in terms of the amount of grass that grows, in terms of uh, the livestock that live there, in terms of the plants, there are a lot of different ways that they could be comparable. It's just not clear. So comparing those two things being so different, it's a struggle to understand what the meaning could be, right? As large as, you can be a little bit more relaxed in terms of the things that are being compared because the meaning is much clearer, right? I have a toy as large as my head. I know what you mean by that. You have some toy, it is as large as your head. It's pretty clear. So when you think about sentence correction, you're not just thinking about good grammar, you're also thinking about good meaning. And sometimes that gets a little bit overlooked. All right. Thank you all again so much for joining. This has been a real pleasure. I will see you all again in January. I have another session coming up. I believe that it is posted. So go and sign up if you would like to attend again. And I hope that all of you have some wonderful holidays coming up here. All right. I'll talk to you again soon. Happy studies.